Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My name is Jennifer Fletcher. I am the associate pastor serving on the Church Street campus and lead pastor Brad Delaney and I are delighted to welcome you to worship today. If you are visiting with us for the first time, welcome. We are so glad that you're here. And we have a special gift for you, a gift card to a local coffee shop. If you would please consider filling out the guest information form in the chat, um, we will send one of these gift cards on to you, and we pray that it's a blessing to you. After worship today, we have a Zoom service of Holy Communion. If you haven't pre-registered for this service, it's not too late to do so by visiting the link that's in the chat. If you've pre-registered, you would have received the Zoom link and also some instructions for preparing for this Holy Communion service. You will want to have your communion elements handy. That's bread or the gluten-free equivalent and grape juice and the appropriate vessels to hold those elements. You might choose to use the prepackaged communion that was included in your Lenten toolkit or you might choose to save that for the Maundy Thursday service that will be coming up in a few weeks. We look forward to celebrating Holy Communion with you directly following worship over Zoom. As a part of our Holy Week observances this year, we want to create a virtual Stations of the Cross for Good Friday. The Stations of the Cross, they tell the story of Jesus' final hours and do so through these pictures that describe certain moments as he's on his way to the cross. And we want to invite your artistic creativity in submitting one of the 14 tableaus in a digital form, created in whatever kind of uh, format that you would like. And we will be showing you a few examples here of what they might look like. And we'll be assembling all of these and putting them together to share as a part of our uh, observances digitally on Good Friday this year. To sign up, there's a, a link, just click on that and you can select which one of the tableaus you'd like to do and uh, find further information as well. I want to give you a quick update as to where we stand regarding our move toward in-person worship here on the Church Street campus. Our Healthy Church team is a group that's tasked with helping advise us around these sorts of questions. Now at this point, both our Healthy Church team and our pastoral team believe it's too early for us to be moving towards in-person services in the sanctuary. Montgomery County currently has the fourth highest infection rates of all Virginia localities. With an average of 55 new cases per 100,000 people, we are solidly in the red COVID risk level as outlined by the Harvard Global Health Institute and the Brown School of Public Health. We want to see our local risk levels down into that orange or yellow level before we proceed with in-person services again. That means our infection rates are going to have to decline by the current rates at a rate of over 50 percent. I mean this is not going to happen overnight. Two things are going to get us there. First, our continued vigilance with precaution. And I, I know we're tired of it, but wearing face masks, hand washing, physical distancing, these are the things that are gonna get us where we need to be sooner. The second thing we can do for those who are comfortable and able to do so is to get vaccinated. My wife Kim got her second vaccine several weeks back. I'm already registered with the Department of Health on their website. If you need any assistance navigating the online registration or the scheduling systems, you're welcome to contact us at the church office. We can refer you to one of our members who's willing to assist. Next Sunday, we'll be announcing our Holy Week and Easter worship plans, and I'm so excited about the creativity and the multiple ways we're going to be able to engage in, through these services at Holy Week. Our Easter services especially are going to take us out into the community to bear witness to the resurrected one who dwells in our midst. May we, friends, continue to persevere as resurrection people, a people of faith, a people of hope, and above all, a people of love. Love for God, love for each other, and love for our community. Please join me in our responsive call to worship. In returning and rest, you shall be saved. 
In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, when I am hurried, anxious, lonely, dealing with the latest interruptions, stuck in my head and so tired I crash at the end of the day, you find me there. Because you, Holy One, are almighty, but not too high and lofty to meet me and the particulars of my day. Instead, you transform these harried moments into invitations to draw closer to you, to find clarity and peace, presence, to encounter the holy. During this Lenten season, O oh God, train my eyes to catch a glimpse of your everyday divinity, moment by moment, day by day. In the name of the Christ, amen. morning. Thank you for being here today. Um, I just wanted to talk to you about what's happening at school on Monday. Everyone is going back to school full time for the first time in almost a year. Um, kids, staff, teachers, um, and as you can imagine, there are a lot of feelings about this, and I just wondered if you could share some words of comfort with us. Wow. Yeah, I, I could just imagine feeling tense and anxious. Uh, you know, my, my own kids 
uh, went Floyd County Schools went back to full time recently, and just being back in that space with so many other students just is a little bit anxiety invoking, and and I know too that there's a lot of kind of frustration and and even anger in our community right now about this move back to school, which is all totally understandable. Yeah, and I imagine the students are feeling overwhelmed, nervous, concerned. What a sudden change in in the way things are operating, the way they've known how to do school this year. And in an ordinary year, it might be exciting to go back, um, but going back with COVID precautions has to be tough. Yeah. Uh, you know, Robin, you, as we were talking about this, had this wonderful idea of let's have a sticker that we can share with all of our students that says, peace be with you. I love those words of Jesus, peace be with you. Uh, he would say them oftentimes when his disciples were feeling overwhelmed or anxious or afraid. Uh, what a helpful reminder. And, and Remember, too, the, this moment when Jesus actually invited the disciples to breathe, breathe in the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, and maybe for some of you who are students or even those of you who are teachers, as you think about those moments when you may feel anxious, to just breathe and be reminded that God's there with you. And, you know, this is a crucial moment where we as a congregation can support the schools in our community. And I think one of the best ways we can do that is by praying for them. And friends, I wonder if you can commit um, to praying intentionally for the school that's closest to where you live, the school in your neighborhood. So maybe when you drive by, pray pray for them, pray for the students and the teachers and the administrators and the staff. Let's as a congregation cover our schools in prayer and we will trust the Holy Spirit to work everything out. Mm. Thank you, Jennifer. In fact, let's, let's pray right now. Gracious God, we thank you for your presence in our world, in our community, and your presence with our schools. Thank you for the gift our schools are to our young people. And God, as they move back to full-time schooling this week, we just pray that you would bless and surround them with your spirit. Uh, I pray for our teachers and for the staff members that you would give them grace upon grace. I pray also, God, for the many others who are involved, the bus drivers, the cafeteria workers, school nurses, custodians, Bless and use them as well. God, I also pray for our Cub Connections program, that you will use them to continue to bless the young people uh, before and after school. And so, God, trusting in your unfailing grace, we offer our, this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I was recently blessed to worship with the Wesley Foundation at Virginia Tech by Zoom. We shared some informal conversation after worship to learn more about what tech students are dealing with right now. And I was really sobered to hear them describing the stories of a very stressful, inconsistent learning environments online, the, the lack of human connection that they have, the isolation of the people who are in quarantine, and, and the lack of any real break from their studies. They said, the last thing we need to do right now is to deal with another email or another Zoom call. But there we were on a Zoom call, 15 to 20 students who had actually hung around after worship I mean, we had been on Zoom for a couple hours at that point. And I was curious, you know, why is it that you're still here? They said, well, this Zoom call is different. Because here at Wesley, we get to actually see each other's faces, to hear one another's stories and voices, and to connect, even if it's virtually. They describe the Wesley community as this life-giving force in their lives right now. We're praying and pondering as a church about some specific ways the students uh, gave us as to how BUMC might bless them. But, but I wanna take just a moment and, and celebrate the good work of the Wesley Foundation. Uh, 
our, our own Brett Gresham, Kelly Wiseman, the work that they're doing is making a huge impact. And that work, friends, is heavily supported by you. BUMC has a long history with the Wesley. You are one of Wesley's biggest supporters through our church budget, which each year uh, gives tremendously to the Wesley Foundation. So friends, I would invite you, if you haven't done so recently, to jump over to our online giving page or to uh, mail a check or bring it by the church office as a way to continue to further the impact that we are making together in Blacksburg and beyond. Let us worship the Lord.
The scripture lesson for today is Mark 6, 34-44 in RSV. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now very late. Send them away, so that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. They said to him, Are we to go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves have you? Go and see. When they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and of fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all, and all ate and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. Those who had eaten the loaves numbered five thousand men. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, sometimes it just doesn't feel like there are enough hours in the day. As we've been going through our Everyday Divinity series, we have been talking about the ordinary moments in which we meet God every day. And one of the most profound opportunities that we have to connect with God and with each other is mealtime. And yet it might be the one that's most often overlooked. You see, if your life is anything like mine, it, meals are often rushed. It is just too easy to pick up, take out, or reheat leftovers. Meal time, instead of a time of connection, is defined by speed and convenience. And if you're like me, it's just too easy to eat dinner in front of the television or in front of your computer right before the next Zoom meeting. Instead of being an opportunity for gratitude and connection, meals often become the other item on our to-do list. And maybe you find yourself in the same boat, whether you are feeding yourself or preparing meals for a family, instead of being a profound means of grace, mealtime can often become an afterthought or another hurried task in the day. As we rush through life and meals, we might find that we rarely pause to give thanks, to connect with others, to eat mindfully. Tish Harrison Warren in her book, The Liturgy of the Ordinary, describes her go-to meal, which is taco soup. Can anyone relate? She says it's not homegrown, not local. It's corn and beans dumped from cans into a crock pot. It's a go-to meal because it's cheap and easy. It is adequate and a little boring. And now it's warmed over again on my stove for lunch. Like most of what I'll eat in this life, it's necessary and forgettable. Can I get an amen? Necessary and forgettable. Hey, we've got to eat. But do we cherish the opportunity? During this isolating season of pandemic, some of us have rediscovered family dinner and experienced mealtime as a time to connect with family because we're all together so much. At one time during lockdown, I read an article or two about the boredom that people were starting to experience because they weren't eating out as much and were cooking at home more. And for some of us, pandemic has amplified our loneliness and we find ourselves more isolated and eating alone. And so we've had to get more creative to find connections around mealtime. 
Perhaps preparing and enjoying meals is one of the clearest expressions of everyday divinity that we can experience on a regular basis. And as we pause to engage with God around meals, we can experience food as a gift, as a reminder of God's presence, and we can move from isolation to community. The Gospel of Mark tells us that Jesus and his disciples were too busy even to eat. Sound familiar? So Jesus invites them to come away to a deserted place and rest a while. Breathe. Prop your feet up. Take a break from the demands of every day. Except, as often happens, there is no rest for the weary in this story because crowds of people saw where they were going and hurried to meet them on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. The crowd was there when they arrived. And the scripture tells us that Jesus had compassion on them. Now, the Greek word for compassion isn't sentimental feeling. It actually means that his guts churned for them. Jesus saw their heart-wrenching condition and he responded to them by teaching them, by feeding their spirit. And in their haste to get to Jesus, nobody remembered to pack a meal. So when it got later in the day, the timeless question arose, what's for dinner? Now the disciples came to Jesus flustered and they said, this is a deserted place and the hour is now late. Send them away so that they can go into the surrounding villages to purchase food for themselves to eat. In other words, let them fend for themselves. But Jesus told them, you give them something to eat. Now the disciples responded, how are we supposed to buy food for all these people? But Jesus said, check your pantry. How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And they discovered five loaves and two fish which is probably plenty for one person. But Mark tells us that there were 5,000 or more people there that day. The disciples must have felt helpless. How would they feed all of these people with such little food? But Jesus was not deterred. Instead, he told the disciples to ask everyone to stay for the picnic. And then... He instructed them to tell the people to sit in pods, oh, I mean groups, on the grass. And in a gesture that early Christians would link to the celebration of Holy Communion, Jesus took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples to distribute. And before he serves this food, Jesus prays. Friends, I have to tell you about the best meal that I made. It was two weeks ago, and it was this wonderful sheet pan salmon dish. So I had fillets of wild-caught salmon, and I cut up bell peppers and onions and opened a can of chickpeas and tossed all of it in olive oil and a spice mixture that I mixed myself. And the fragrance of the spices and the cooking fish as it baked filled my apartment. And since it's my tendency to often reheat leftovers or graze through whatever I have in the refrigerator, this dinner felt way too fancy for a weeknight. And not only was the smell tantalizing, but when I opened the oven and pulled that sheet pan dinner out, oh, My senses were delighted by the colors, the smells, and my first response was to utter a prayer of gratitude for the gift of this meal. God, thank you for this delicious food. And in that moment, the impulse kind of surprised me because so often dinner is about convenience rather than appreciation. My instinct to pause and pray and thank God connected me to God who provided that meal as a gift. 
Because you see, food is evidence of God's love for us, a tangible expression of God's grace, which we get to enjoy every day. And so when we take the time to prepare a meal, to enjoy it with a grateful heart, we have the chance to experience the love of God who is our provider and sustainer and who always gives us more than enough for each day. So whether you are eating with others or eating alone, I wonder how your awareness of God's presence in that moment would be amplified by beginning with a prayer. You know, often one of the first prayers that we learn as children is a mealtime blessing. My little sisters learned one in preschool that I'm going to share with you. And if you know it, feel free to say it with me. Thank you for the world so sweet. Thank you for the food we eat. Thank you for the birds that sing. Thank you, God, for everything. We would recite this prayer together as a family, an expression of our gratitude. Maybe you already have a habit of saying grace before a meal. Maybe you often overlook this ritual in the midst of the hustle and bustle of daily life. Or maybe you're starting this practice for the first time. Pausing to pray before a meal connects us to the giver of life. And like the preschool table grace that included gratitude for the world and for the birds that sing, praying before a meal connects us to all of life. Because in my prayer, I acknowledge that this meal is a gift. Even though I work hard, it's not ultimately something that I provided for myself on my own. It's a gift from God. And praying draws me closer to God and others because my eyes and heart are opened to God's provision through others, through the farmer and the workers who planted and nurtured and harvested, the truck driver who hauled all this food to the store where the grocery store worker um, unloaded the truck and then stocked the shelves where I came and chose my item off the shelves and took it home to prepare for dinner. Without me even knowing, countless others touched this food before I even had the chance to prepare the meal. Food connects us to each other. So what might it look like for you to create space in mealtime for prayer? You might choose to take a moment before eating to pause and light the candle that's been included in your Lenten toolkit before the meal. If you are sharing this meal with others, you might take turns offering a prayer of gratitude and pause even to share the experiences of your day. Whether you're eating with others or eating alone, you could choose to silence your cell phone or eat in a location that's away from your computer, away from the television and other distractions, and eat with attention to the flavors, textures, and foods that are such a gift. As you allow the experience of preparing food and the simple pleasure of eating food, draw you closer to God. This becomes an experience of everyday divinity. And as we pause to engage with God around meals, we can experience food as a gift and a reminder of God's presence that we never eat alone. Growing up, Meals were rarely consumed alone. Both of my parents worked, but they still insisted that we all gather together around the table each evening without our cell phones to enjoy food and to have conversation and recap our day. Holiday meals with extended family were big and loud with lots of people packed around the table. Church life was full of potluck suppers where everyone brought a dish to share. And Mark tells us that with Christ's blessing and generous sharing, 
a little bit went a long way, just like those potlucks, because all 5,000, 5,000 plus really, because the gospel doesn't take into account the women and children that would have been present, all of those people ate and were filled, and then there were 12 baskets of pieces left over. At Christ's table, there is always more than enough to go around, and people are filled, body and soul. Food connects us in community. And during pandemic, even as most of us find ourselves eating alone, persons have still found creative ways of gathering and connecting around food. Some have organized Zoom dinners, Zoom holiday gatherings, Zoom recipe exchanges, socially distanced gatherings in the backyard. In October, I enjoyed an outdoor picnic with a friend and her family in their yard. We ate together, picnic style, and then we carved jack-o'-lanterns together. In the earlier days of the pandemic lockdown, my sisters and I, one who lives as far away as Texas, started what we called the No Stress Sister Book Club. And so we got together on Friday mornings over Zoom to discuss a book that we were reading together and to eat breakfast together and to drink coffee and to enjoy each other's company. Even if we find ourselves eating alone, there are ways that we can connect in community I wonder what opportunities you might find in your own life. You might choose to make your next dinner a Zoom date with a friend, or you might even choose to use the card and the stamp that are provided in your Lenten toolkit to write someone a note after dinner, maybe someone who is especially isolated during this time and use that as a means of connection. Or if you're picking up takeout, maybe order an extra meal. Or if you've prepared a meal that's too much for you, package up the leftovers and deliver them to a neighbor. If we are creative, we can find ways to reconnect, to restore community and connection at mealtime, even in pandemic time. And as Christ has promised to meet us in ordinary meals like bread and juice, our table becomes holy. In fact, it becomes an extension of the table. Tabga, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, is the place where tradition holds that the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 took place. And in Tabga, there is a church dating back to the 5th century. And in that church, there is an altar that's built over top of a rock. And it's on this rock that early Christians believed Jesus broke the bread in that miracle. In front of the rock, in the floor, there's an ancient mosaic. And the mosaic depicts four loaves and two fishes. Four loaves. That seems strange because there's supposed to be five, right? But the worshipers in that congregation understood that the fifth loaf is on the altar that each time they came together to celebrate Holy Communion, they were experiencing that miracle once again. Friends, Christians have always understood that Christ meets us in a mysterious way when we celebrate communion together. And indeed, Christ meets us in any meal. The Gospel of Luke records the story of the walk to Emmaus where after Jesus was crucified, two disciples were returning to the town called Emmaus on the road and as they were walking along, a stranger joined them. 
And they began to talk with this stranger and tell him all about the things that had taken place in Jerusalem. And they talked about the scriptures together. And then as night began to fall and they got closer to their destination, they invited this stranger to come home with them for supper. And the scripture tells us that as the stranger broke the bread, they recognized in that moment the risen Christ who had been walking with them all along. Because Christ has chosen to meet us in ordinary bread and wine, juice, that means that our tables can become extensions of the table. Opportunities to be nourished and to encounter Christ. And so this act of eating a meal with a grateful heart becomes less ordinary and more sacred. A reminder of Christ with us. After worship today, we will have the chance to share in a Zoom service of Holy Communion. And so we will break bread together virtually, extending the table from this sanctuary to our homes. And in this virtual experience of Holy Communion, our dining room tables, our side tables, our coffee tables will become extensions of the table. And together, as we gather with ordinary bread and juice, we will experience this holy mystery which sustains us. If we didn't know it before, I pray that we know this afternoon that when we share this meal, when we share a meal with grateful hearts, we never dine alone. Amen. I would invite you to join me in prayer. Almighty God, we come before you with a deep and profound gratitude, so grateful for the ways in which you show up in our lives and in our world day by day. You come in those moments when we are hungry, when we are thirsty, and you provide for us, sometimes literally through bread and, and water for those who are in need of it. At other times, you show up in the, the bread and the gift of presence in the face of another person, or in the gift of a card or a phone call, or even just a text from someone reminding us that we are not alone in this world. We thank you, God, that in the deepest way possible, we are not alone because you are an incarnate God who has come through Christ Jesus wading into the thick of our humanity. We praise you, God, for the way by your Holy Spirit you continue to be active and uh, at work in the world around us and even within us. God, it's in the spirit of that faith that we want to name before you people we know and care about who are dealing with struggles, who are facing hardships, who need to know they are not alone right now. We pray for Lou Talbot, for Megan Hughes, Jim Montgomery, Don Musser, for Dick Arnold. We lift up the family of Louise Howard. God, each of these and many others that we name silently in our hearts before you right now, we hold them out of love, asking that you would meet them at their point of need, grant them healing in whatever way they need it, in mind, body, spirit, or relationship. God, we pray, too, for the greater world of which we are a part. We pray for those who literally are starving for lack of bread in places like Yemen and in other places, God, where warfare, where famine prevails. And we, God, pray that you would work to bring about a peace with justice that would enable those who are hungry, who are thirsty, to receive the aid they desperately need that you would be with those who are hurting. God, we pray for your church, 
not only the United Methodist Church, but your global body of Christ, God, that you would embolden us to show up in those places, both in our community and around the world where people are lonely and hurting. God, thank you that I get to be a part of a church like this one who takes that very seriously. You reminded Eve, even just this week of, of ways in which this church has blessed uh, the, those who are at the New River Valley Juvenile Detention Center. Just, God, continue to take us and use us and help us to show up in the world in ways in which uh, others will know that they are not alone, that they are not forgotten. So it is that we lift this prayer in the name of Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray for our daily bread by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, go in peace, discovering God in the sacredness of every meal. Amen. <laughs>